Like, we don't have riots. <laughs> like, but and the riots were fun. <laughs> like, we had one riot in the boys' unit. When I tell you, it was so much fun because it was just like. I gotta get it now, I gotta get it right. I gotta live it up, I never minimize. minimize. Doesn't really matter how I live it, die. What's going on, amazing people? It's your girl Nasha, and I'm back with another video. Y'all, today I'm gonna do a little mukbang, and I got some fruit. Because your girl, you know, your girl getting a little big with all these taste testing and food reviews, okay? So we're gonna switch it up a little bit. So, y'all, in this video, okay, I am going to talk about my seven year experience in the law enforcement field, okay? And I say law enforcement field, that doesn't necessarily mean I was a police officer. I spent seven years of my life, of my work, majority of my work, like 98%, 99% of my working life as a correction officer and a probation officer. So, just to give you a little timeline real quick before I go into detail. I started off as a JCO, which is a juvenile correction officer. Then I went to ISO, which is in the probation realm. And then I went to corrections with adults. And I got promoted and all that stuff. If you are interested and you liking this video so far, which I know you are, so please go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Leave me a comment as well. And let me know what you think about the story. Let me know if you want to know something else after hearing the end of this video, okay? So anyways. <laughs> so anyways, y'all. Let me get some my fruit. My fruit. Y'all, I am 30 now. I started my career in 2000, 2013. And I started my career in 2013 and I ended it in 2020. Yeah, 2020. Seven years, y'all, seven years. Oh yeah. And I got cantaloupe, strawberries, and oranges. It said orange, but it looked like a um a grapefruit, but it's orange. But anyways, we're gonna get right into the video, okay? Six months prior to, to me turning 21, I decided I wanted to be a juvenile correction officer. <sighs> when I tell y'all, I was fiending for this job, like being, I, I kept applying for first shift because I did not want to work overnight. Never worked overnight, didn't want to try to work overnight. So was never getting a call back. Eventually I applied for third shift, got the call. Just like that, I'm like, Damn. I got the job and I started, I went to train. Did that for four weeks, got certified, boom. And so y'all, yeah, me getting into the units, I was so scared at first. Like, I'm not even gonna say scared. I'ma just say I was taking it all in because it was a lot. Like, to be freshly new and then you gotta come into these units with these juveniles, like kids that the court has says you are delinquent, you can't be on the streets. It was a lot, so. And when I first started, I didn't have a voice. I didn't have like, like I wasn't who I am now, like at all. I was like, you know, a little shy, a little like soft. I was a lot softer then, like, but as times went by, <laughs> I got much harder and um, I gained my voice. Crazy thing about it, Apparently, they the the kids were saying that they didn't like me because I was too strict. I don't think I was strict. I just think I'm just doing my job, and I like to follow the rules. And you're not finna get on my nerves. And no, so <laughs> I started in 2013. 
I won JCO of the quarter in 2014. And actually, I still got the plaque, so hold on. It's a little dusty, but this is the plaque. It says, damn, it's a lot dusty. It says, JCO of the quarter, 2014, for January, February, March, South Carolina Department of Juvenile, my name, and the South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice. Now, mind you, I started in 2013, so your girl got recognized real quick. So, <laughs> So when you win JCO of the quarter, you and the other guys that had JCO of the quarter for the year get put into like you everybody gets interviewed. So, so it's like four of us. And so we all had to interview, and whoever they chose for the interview won JCO of the year. And then, which by the way, I won. <laughs> and your girl, they put your girl in, on the front page of the newspaper. Oh my God. Once you win Ju um, JCO of the Year for your facility, then you are in the running for JCO of the Year for the state. So now it's you and other people that won JCO of the Year for their facility come to together to Columbia for another interview and then they pick a winner. You have an interview and then they pick a winner. Unfortunately, I didn't win that one, but whatever. So, I did that for like, I did I did juvenile corrections at first for like three years. I went through a lot of rough times because I wasn't like, I was really soft. And it, I just had a hard time like, dealing with people and like my grandmother like passed the year before 2012 like I'm like freshly 21 like it was a lot starting out as a JCO at the facility well back in the day the entire all the facilities we were able to have DVD players right when I tell y'all stuff started changing over the years and it literally changed for the bad so we were able to have my bad. <laughs> we were able to have our DVD players, um, and it was for night shift for one. And it helped because you pop in like two or three videos your nights over with, as long as you did your checks. Once they took the DVDs out because the incident had happened, rest in peace. And so there was like, nah, no more DVDs. Instead of punishing that one person, they punished every damn body. So that sucked. So. Things just start changing, you know, being the corrections is always like staff shortage, like turnover rates and stuff like that. But when the girl finally got her degree, when I say f finally got her degree, I was going to school full time and I was working full time. That shit was hard. Finally got my degree, I'm like, okay, I didn't use my degree. So I started applying elsewhere and so I started applying and I got a job as an ISO so what the ISO is it's probation juvenile probation and it's intensive supervision officer so basically I'll just be a probation officer but I'll deal with the more intensive kids like the worst charges behaviors stuff like that I did that for six months had to go and I came back to the facility that I left. When I tell y'all, as an ISO, that was, an ex that was an experience because <laughs> there was problems in the office. I think there was low key racist because they were giving the black kids worse sentences for lesser, for like lighter crimes, but whatever. One of the girls' caseload was like beefing hella crazy, like, Half her caseload was beefing like with each other, like <laughs> shooting each other up. And like one time I had went out with her to do visits and stuff. And we had pulled up and the mother was on my side, right? The, looking through the window. But she kept like looking over her shoulder 
looking over her shoulder and stuff like that. And her son was already, like, he couldn't come outside because he had a target. Like, you step on that porch, you had scratch. Like, they had people waiting for him to step out on the porch. Like, these kids, these are kids we're talking about. So, basically, like, she was paranoid as fuck. And she kept looking over her shoulder. And, like, she wasn't saying much. She was literally talking in cold because she didn't know who was watching. And there was a car behind us. And she didn't know who car it was. So we had to end the conversation short. And then we was like, yo, let's get, <laughs> let's get up out of but we get shot up. And nah, I ain't trying to get shot up. So <laughs> we left and we was like, bruh, what the fuck? Because this is too serious. Honestly, they killed them. I want to say, I want to say so because. And I don't want to go into detail about like his, what happened. Because Jenny's not going to come up to me. For you. So I wound up leaving because they were trying to get me out anyway. So I wound up going back. To, and I love being ISO. I love being ISO. You get to go out. Like you're not stuck. But anyways, I went back to corrections, did a couple more years. When I went back is when I started going up for promotions. And I went up for three promotions and didn't get any of them. When I tell y'all that crushed, crushed me. Because I know for a fact that I was overqualified for those positions. I don't care what nobody say. I had several years of experience, two degrees, JCO the quarter, JCO the year, and I didn't get I didn't get not one promotion. Not one. It was fucked up, but it is what it is. You know? You learn from it. You keep going. Cause I wanted to stay in DJJ. I really do. I really wanted to retire. <laughs> From DJJ, and but it was mm -mm. so. Let me fast forward because it's, it's a lot. I might do a part two. I don't know. But um, so basically, ending my career. If you want me to go into more details, you guys, let me know. Leave a comment in the comment section. But um. And we don't have riots. <laughs> like, but and the riots were fun. <laughs> like, we had one riot in the boys' unit. When I tell you, it was so much fun. Cause it was just like, I don't know, like, like your adrenaline just be going. I don't know. And it was in the male unit. Like the roughest unit. And like when I heard the uh, when I heard the thing on the assistance, assistance, like <laughs> I just ran off to the unit to, and here I am breaking up boys that are high off adrenaline, ready to kick ass. And it was hard because I'm a female and I'm not mad or nothing. You know how you get you get more stronger when you're mad. So their strength like was like ten times regular strength. And here I am trying to break it up, but the girl was breaking up the fights. Okay. So, um, but y'all, there was this one fight. There was this one fight that changed my life forever. Like, on a serious note, I love the job, the, like, but this one incident changed my life forever. I didn't know it at the time, but... I don't know. Let me just, I give you the gist of it. And if you want me to go into detail, leave a comment and I'll give you a story time. So we were short staff and um, I was put in the girls, the girls dorm. And so there was male dorms, which was the main campus. And then there was a girls dorm, which was, you had to get through one, two, two doors. Go down the hill, 
get through one, two, three doors, three more doors. And the doors are operated by the control room, right? So it's not just a smooth, like just open the door. Like if the control room person is not paying attention, then you'll be standing at the door, just waiting. So anyways, long story short, we were short staff, so I was down there by myself. It was literally like eight girls. But when I tell you these girls were manipulative, <laughs> shysty, conniving, like these were street girls. So they wind up set me up and beat the living shit out of this one girl and she didn't even do nothing and the reason why they got her is because the girl who they wanted was in the box and they couldn't get to the box and it's it's a lot because it was so calculated it was like set it off how they pulled it off and everything and i was already like sleep deprived because i had worked i had already worked the first shift and this is when we had went to eight eight hour shifts I had already worked the first shift. Yeah, and this was Saturday. So I worked a double Friday. I did a double Saturday. This is when it happened. I had worked first shift um, visitation. And then I was on my shift. And when I'm taking over the unit, beating the shit out of this girl, and she didn't even do nothing. Cause just cause she was friends with the girl who they couldn't even get. But the way it was like, calculated and like it was bad like the girl she got she got tore <laughs> it was bad <laughs> it was bad so I wish I would have known then what I knew now because honestly that incident messed me up so bad mentally like seriously and people didn't know like because I didn't tell anybody because for one, I was the strongest on the shift. And well, I'll say strongest female. I'm not, a, I'm not a dude, so I can't say I'm the strongest on the shift. But like that night, like I went home and like, like I had nightmares from that incident. There were several days that I woke up in the middle of the night with sweats. I woke up screaming. I woke up like just terrified, like scared because that was one of the first times that I didn't have control. And it was my job and it was my duty to protect that girl. And it was, it was more than one fight. It was two fights and but she got fucked up the most. But um, like it really messed me up. I take my job serious. I take my job super serious. And I, like I said, like I wanted to do this for my entire career. But once I felt powerless and I could not help that girl, because that is my job and my duty to to help to to protect you know protect them. I may sound like a dork or whatever, but like I took my job that serious. And once they took that power and that control, and I was unable to fulfill my duty, looking at how bad she got messed up, like it messed with me. And then I didn't, I didn't want to say nothing. I didn't want to say nothing because like, you know, I wanted promotions. I wanted to move on up and I didn't want me like going to therapy to hinder me from moving on up even though it's not supposed to but they would it wouldn't people would know you know and i didn't want people to think that i was weak and like i couldn't handle my job and you know i'm not that strong because i am but and i used to call uh, my homeboy at the time Cause he worked at the facility too. And like, I would talk to him about it. He understood like what I was going through. 
because like the job is hard like the job can be hard and but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna get off of that part because uh, it still bothers me to this day sometimes but but yeah so literally the next day I'm thinking like okay you know I'm gonna be put in the control room because I don't had a hella crazy ass night right nope I got put right back down there and um like and everybody was laughing in briefing like they were like laughing at the incident because I was literally screaming over the radio because the help it seemed it seemed so long for me to get help because remember I told you all the doors that you got to get through we was already short staffed and like it just seemed like it took them like 20 damn minutes to get there. And it was, the incident probably lasted like not even five. <laughs> not even five minutes. We had older supervisors and they were the only one that was on the floor to, re, you know, to come help. And it was no way they was getting in like five minutes, so. But if I knew, I don't know y'all, like, I should have said something. I should have, you know, gotten some type of help because it really did mess me up. Like I, from that incident was the start of me no, me no longer wanting this career because it took a lot out of me. And um, get on top of that, I got blamed and I got rolled up for some shit that I didn't even do. There was no evidence of it. There was no like, the girls, once again the girls, conjured up this story that I did something and wrote it up and I want them getting, I, got, I want them getting rolled up for it and it was complete bullshit. I'm like, yeah, that's not it. So, if y'all want me to do a story time, let me know in the comments. But, um, then they started, like, and it was, like, upper, upper, upper people in Columbia, like, doing the moves, like, changing all these rules. You can't put your hands on them. So, if we can't put our hands on them, then we can't break up a fight. But then if we don't break up a fight, that's neglecting your duty. So, what the fuck do y'all want us to do? Like, make it... Pick a side, pick a side, pick a side. But anyway, so I wound up leaving for the second time. <laughs> for the second time, I wrote a crazy as resignation letter that was directed towards Columbia with a bullshit. And I heard that the head dude in charge got my letter so, I know I'm probably not welcome back at DJJ anymore. <laughs> I don't even care. I don't care. But, um, so I wound up taking a, this is when I went towards corrections. So, I wound up taking a lesser paying job at a level one facility. <sighs> so, because I'm like, in my mind, I felt like, I know this is what I wanted to do. So it must be this facility. You know, so let me change change my environment, change the facility so I can get my spark back because this is what I want to do. I know this is what I want to do. I've been, this has been set already. So I want to go into a level one and they're like, they go to work and so it's not as security based as like I don't there was no barbed wire. Like they, they literally could just walk off. So but that's the charge. So anyways, I wanna take in a pay cut. Because I'm like, I'm not doing this shit. Cause y'all bugging out. Y'all don't care about y'all people. Like, 
we ain't hit any trenches with these motherfuckers and y'all writing us out for the dumbest stuff. Y'all not taking us into consideration and the officers, us, are the ones keeping this building afloat. So I'm like, yeah, I gotta go. So, took a pay cut. I'm trying to hurry up because this video man long. Took a pay cut. Went to corrections. Went to the academy, y'all. When I tell y'all Jane Academy was crazy, them motherfuckers was fighting. Everybody was like, it's just horrible. And that's one thing about corrections. <laughs> Did I get drunk? I think I got drunk. No, we had went out, y'all. Pause. <laughs> I'm gonna do a story time. Let me know if you wanna hear a story time about the time I got drunk at um, juvenile training. And fucking, <laughs> I could not focus. Fucking threw up. And it was like, anyways, let me know if y'all want a story time. I, I'll do a story time on that. My fourth week, it was like that Monday or Tuesday, fourth week at Training Academy. I got a promotion. I got the call. Something told me, it was on break, I got the call, and um, something told me to go to my dorm, because we had to share dorms. Um, so it was two of us in a twin size bed. I would share a picture of it, but we not allowed to. Twin size bed, and so two people share a room, and then there's a bathroom, and then there's two people on the other side. So, four females sharing one bathroom, one toilet, one shower. It was horrible. But, um, something told me to go, um, go to my dorm and, and just chill. And, because we couldn't have our phones with us, so I kept my phone in my dorm. So, I went to the toilet. <laughs> and I just get a phone call. And it was a promotion for a sergeant. And I've always wanted to be a sergeant. Like I said, my dream was to move up. So I always wanted to be, I always wanted to have right, and have that white shirt, that crispy ass white shirt. I've always dreamt of that, right? So, but it was for level three maximum security. So while I'm taking a job, went to this level three maximum security prison, all males. Why they put my ass straight in lockup? They put me straight in lockup. I was literally the only black person up there. <laughs> what an experience. But um, I wound up getting pissed on. Oh, my light. Okay, y'all, so my battery, one of my um lights died. So this won't work away. Um, I wound up getting pissed on on me in lockup. That was hilarious. And I wound up getting sued later on down the line. Like, yeah, one of the motherfuckers inmates tried to sue me. And if y'all want a story time, let me know. <laughs> okay, y'all. So, one of my um, lights died and I can't find a cord, so... I'm just using my light and it's giving me a light. So I'm gonna just pick up. So I wanna get urine thrown on me. And um and there was just a lot of stuff that just went on in lockup that I just didn't want no parts of. I got sent to the yard, which is general population whatever. And then so I did my time on the yard, I worked the mess hall, worked the dorms. I think I worked the yard. I think I was a yard officer. Probably like once. <laughs> Not even once. But let me say this. So, once I went to the level one facility, um, I felt like, in my heart, I felt like, okay, I'm going to get my spunk back. I'm going to get I'm gonna get me back, right? Never happened. So, once I got prom promoted, I got the opportunity to get a promotion... I'm like, okay, well, maybe this is going to help me get my spunk back because, <clears throat> because now I'm getting something that I've always wanted. 
I always wanted rank. I always wanted, you know, the the, the supervisor role. So once I got it, it didn't change anything. My heart was still the same. Like I'm over this, and I know I keep moving, but I'm trying to get some light. And I honestly, truly believe it was from that one incident at DJJ that I was talking about earlier. And I feel like if I would have said something and got some help, like I would have been able to work through it and then, you know, pick back up there and continue my career and, you know, in corrections or whatever. I actually did like working in um, corrections. I met some amazing people. I ain't gonna say our names, but my girl, she ran a yard. My boy, he ran a gate. And like working in corrections, like you get a lot of experience. Like <laughs> you see shit, you hear stuff. It's a lot, but it was fun too. Like, but don't get me wrong, it's pretty. You know how you go through the airport or whatever, and you go through the um. The scanner, we had to get scanned every day. And like there's certain stipulations on what you could bring inside. And I think my heart plus all this other stuff is what made me leave corrections in the first place. It, it was just too much. Like you could only bring in five bottles of water. Like bitch. For 12 hours, one day I got so dehydrated because we have on, um, they're not bulletproof vests, but they're like stab, stab proof or something like that. And I was working lockup and we were short staff. And so I had to do a lot of running around. I had to do like all the work. And the next day I was so sick. I was so dizzy. I, I thought I was gonna die. And then I didn't really, I was sweating that whole day. And like, so the next day I, I, I said I was sick, but I had drank fluids. So I'm like, maybe I'm dehydrated. And that's what the fuck it was. I was dehydrated. One day, like, cause we gotta go through like a gate. You gotta go through a gate to get to the yard, right? So I went through the gate and then like, I was walking to my dorm and I just stopped and looked. Like I was just, I just looked like around me. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> what the fuck is this? You know, I can't even drink coffee. Like I can't even go get my own coffee. Like an inmate has to bring me my coffee. Like I have to tell him how I want it. And then he brings it to me. Like, I can't even get my own coffee. Eventually, like, we wound up doing, like, coffee before we got to the dorm. But it was like, if I wasn't able to get coffee before I got to my dorm, an inmate had to bring my dorm. I mean, an inmate had to bring my coffee and just fix it up how I told him to. And hopefully it was right because, you know, it's trial and error when you make coffee. Especially if it's from a coffee pot and the person don't make the coffee right. So, yeah, and this is, like, what am I doing? Like, granted, I want to go back. I want to go back, but I just don't know if I have that passion still. So, I don't know. I've been debating. I've been thinking about going to the city. I don't know. I wound up making the decision to leave corrections. And... It was hard. It was it was a hard one because it's like my other life just went out. <laughs> the fuck. Um this is okay. Whatever. So I hope this is okay. So I wound up leaving correction. It was super hard because I didn't want to feel like no like like um what's the word? I don't want to feel like I failed. Like, I, did, I felt like I was failing my parents. I 
felt like I was failing myself. I felt like I was letting my, you know, I was letting my parents down. Um, so yeah, like it was a lot. Like I even made an excuse, <laughs> low key. Like I wanted to leave so bad that I was trying to convince my boyfriend at the time to tell me to leave. I couldn't do it. I couldn't leave something like this that I know I've always wanted. And my parents were proud of me of doing it. I'm sorry. The thing is shaking. Because my damn hand. My parents were proud of me for doing it. And I didn't want to let them down. So I wound up telling my boyfriend at the time. I was like, you know, if it gets unsafe, would you tell me to leave? And that was my way of saying, like, please pull me out because I can't do it myself. Like, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> and, um, but y'all, yeah, his answer was, I'm not going to tell you to do something that you don't want to do. And my mom like, bitch, no, you're not understanding me. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying, okay? So that plan didn't work. I wound up leaving and going somewhere else. <laughs> then I wound up leaving. I did that for a year. I did corrections for like a year. Literally, like. I left around like the anniversary. My anniversary. I've always left around my anniversary. February 4th. So I wound up doing corrections for a year, and then I wound up getting into like DSS. That's a whole different story. <laughs> That's a whole different story. And so I did that for a year, but we not talking about that. But yeah. So that is my experience in corrections. That pretty much sums it up. I know this video is mad long, but I try not to go into detail about certain things because that was just gonna make the video stupid long if you like this video if you're interested in more correction videos subscribe to my channel leave me a comment give me a like share the video spread the word you know tell other people yada 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 and at the end of the day don't forget to like comment and subscribe to my channel